Allow me a moment for a quick celebrate wonder review. We launched this theme in September, and the month long theme was creativity. We looked at how God created the heavens and the earth and all living things and all people beginning with Adam and Eve. We then moved into October where the theme was faith. The faith of Abraham and Sarah, the promise of a great nation that concluded with the laughable birth of Isaac. And today it's November already as we celebrate wonder, as we enter our third month. And the theme is wilderness. Heading towards that promised land now with Jacob and Esau, who struggles within the womb, and the struggle continues today. So welcome to All Saints Sunday, but a moment of confession, if you would. When Lynn and I were reviewing this Celebrate Wonder theme, and I was looking through the specific Sundays and saw All Saints Sunday, which is one of my favorite Sundays, and I saw that the scripture reading was Jacob and Esau, and I'm thinking to myself, what in the world am I going to do with that? Everything. It's a story about the generations. The generations of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so this morning we take a moment and take a pit stop at the Genesis 25 generation. Genealogies in the book of Genesis are important. As a matter of fact, there are ten of them. Ten times the authors go back to the genealogies to remind us from whence we have come from. This is the eighth genealogy of ten that is found in the book of Genesis. I would like to take a moment to take a look at this specific generation because it sets the table for the next three weeks. The next three weeks we really take a hard look at Jacob as we enter then into the season of Advent. So let's look at this cast of characters for a moment. First, Rebecca, whose name means moderator or to tie, noose, to bind, captivating, strong combatant, and hardy, whose story mirrors Sarah's story in so many ways. The wonder of the beginning where she was all starry-eyed and the world was full of potential as she marries Isaac. You remember that? You know, just being married and the world will be your oyster with smooth sailing every single day. So there she was, all set to leave everything she knew to head to the promised land to fulfill God's continuing promise of a great nation and that promise included her to be the mother of thousands and the mother of tens of thousands, and off she went. But this chapter soon turns her optimism toward the present anguish of barrenness. Giving birth was her role in the continuing drama, and now, unable to do so, she finds herself struggling and trying to understand her role in this divine promise. I know you probably have heard it many times. But for a woman in biblical times, that was her highest calling. To put it in today's vernacular, children were the biblical and cultural social security system. Now do we understand it? It was their social security system that the children would care for the widow and provide for her. But once pregnant, she soon realizes that her pregnancy is not typical. It wasn't all about what the nursery might look like or how are we going to buy clothing for this child or, oh, look, they're kicking. Press here and feel from within. No, rather, instead... 
There's a struggle within her womb. From barrenness comes a pregnancy at war with itself. Wow. Then there's Isaac. We heard last week that his name in Hebrew is interpreted, he laughs or will laugh. Now Isaac was always cast in the middle, often forgotten, whose life was between his father Abraham and his son Jacob. As a matter of fact, very little is said about Isaac in the Bible. His life was overshadowed by his father and son. And Jacob, now in the 26th chapter of Genesis, as we move forward, is the main focus of the next 11 chapters of Genesis, not Isaac. Even if you look at the biblical names, it illustrates how Isaac was overshadowed. Remember, Abraham was Abram. Remember that? Exalted father. Abraham means father of the multitudes. Then you have Jacob. His name gets changed. We'll get to that. To Israel. A nation. And then there's Isaac. <laughs> he laughs. And his name never changes. <laughs> However, Scripture depicts the faithfulness of Isaac. As he never leaves his homeland, nomadic Abraham bounces to many places, as does Jacob on their way to the promised land, but Isaac stays put, faithful, loyal, and devoted. And now we come to those wonderful words in chapter 25. Behold. Behold. The moment of the birth of the two sons in the womb of Rebekah. First was Esau, whose name means Harry. The firstborn, who is described by his physical attributes. Don't forget that. Esau is described how he looks. Red and hairy. Even today, the color red has some present cultural understandings. Having reddish hair is oftentimes associated with someone with passion and strength and independence and fiery. And in this case, kind of macho and manly. Being born ahead of his brother puts Esau in a pretty sweet spot within biblical culture as it provided him an inheritance, a patriarchal, and societal privileges. Right from the womb, Esau's status and future was stacked in his favor. He held the power position over Jacob. Let's talk about Jacob for a moment. His name means to follow, to be behind, to supplant, circumvent, assail, overreach, or heal. This second-born child is not described by the way he looks, but by his action. Huge difference. The action of holding the heel of his older brother Esau. His birth position instantly places him in a position to less likely succeed in life. And in the weeks ahead, we will uncover and discover his tactics of lying, deceiving, and manipulating as he moves closer to the promises and predictions of God. I end with this. I spend these moments introducing this dysfunctional family to you this morning as a living, breathing example of how families and generations are both a blessing and broken. <laughs> we could spend the rest of the year talking about that, couldn't we? The experiences in our families that have blessed us and broken us to the very core. These nine folks could do the same. However, in this wilderness of life, 
in this wilderness of family and faith, God still holds the promise yet today for us. The promise of God's kingdom and our role in it as it exists on earth, as it is in heaven. The very example of that promise lived out by the life of Jesus who taught by parables the lessons of justice, mercy, healing, grace, and love. A promise that binds us together is the body that we call Jesus the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. So on this All Saints Sunday, where we remember and honor our brothers and sisters of this generation and the generations before, may we affirm this time, this place, and these people as the torch bearers of the very same promise that we trace back to the beginning of time. And friends, if that doesn't create a sense of wonder, what does?